introduction and then they will start the lecture sir sure yes sir so uh, uh, shall we start now sir or should we wait for another one or two more minutes is left to you you are the host <laughs> no why because you no know, people are joining now Still, yes okay. that's why i uh, because no they will be missing little bit information initially so one or sure. two minutes they wanted to delay sir okay that's fine okay so in the meantime i can talk to dr batacharya or yes, dr santil gotan gotan siyama yes sir yeah gotan siyama and uh, uh, yeah. even esther must be also there esther also. Uh, 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 esther will be joining sir uh, shortly yes, sir. Yes, sir. can you hear me clearly uh, yes sir well, you are a little away from mic sir it seems sir. little okay. away from mic and uh, uh, you are looking on top uh, konj pike chustunnar sir konj pike chustunnar yeah so can, i know what happened i told your colleagues that i have laptop and i connected to the larger screen oh okay uh, okay yeah okay. so okay, that's okay. what i am so uh, now slides are my slides are there because earlier my slides were here there yes, was sir. some issues so then i moved yes. to the screen and now yes, i yes, no problem sir you as you comfortable uh, you do sir no problem yeah no problem. but you can hear me that is more important um, right think, uh, is it okay santil uh, voice <coughs> yes sir voice is okay sir voice is good okay these are clearly audible sir right so dr uh, jyotan siyama yes, you... yes yes what is your area of interest and uh, what you yes, are sir like uh, i'm just starting my first thing like uh, yeah i'm also working with uh, cancer i have screen uh, we were screening this uh, different uh, medicinal plants of mizoram those mm-hmm. that has been reported to have uh, anti cancer activity that is the traditional knowledge so we are just looking for the scientific validation so we did some extraction from the medicinal plant and then we just screen in the different human cancer cell line and see whether they have an effects or not any particular can- cancer of interest yeah like sir presently currently we are working with uh, lung cancer uh, the cell line is f549 cell line mm-hmm. excellent excellent yes uh, so trying to find some sort of uh, chemo preventive agents or therapeutic agents what are the uh, where the efforts are directed to yeah it's mostly connected with the therapeutic uh, purpose so we did an extraction and we are following this uh, bisa guided fractionization so we have to look into the active compound uh, mm-hmm. that possess uh, any cancer activity So yes. not a cancer specific, gen- in, in general, you are screening some of those compounds. Are yeah, there. now we are doing in general screening. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, first we look into whether they are uh, cy- uh, showing some cyto- uh, cytotoxic effect or not. And then we also study the gene expression using a real-time PCR. Mm-hmm. And then we do some other sort of uh, work also. Sure. yeah like uh, in future we would like to end up with uh, if there is any active compounds from the traditionally used uh, medicine uh, medicinal plant excellent mm. that's great so i wish you good luck and oh, quickly you, sir got to charge yeah hello hey morning. good morning yeah dr batacharya i think he is online yeah. Uh, hello hello yeah uh, am i audible now yes yes uh, so nice uh, you know meeting you sir i work on uh, entirely different field it's mm-hmm. on oxidative stress biology of cyanobacteria they mm-hmm. are a class of uh, photosynthetic prokaryotes mm-hmm. with wide distribution in nature and having uh you know a potential for applications in uh, uh various fields 
in agriculture as well as for industrial applications and uh, i i look at uh, you know the different uh, proteins and uh, genes and their corresponding genes that participate in uh, oxidative stress tolerance in this organism mm -hmm. and uh, try to you know mimic the situations in nature in laboratory but to bring the analogy to the cancer cancer also lives in oxygen depleted con condition and yeah. uh, yeah, the similar situations, uh, similar, some of the pathways and mechanisms may be similar in cancer too. Yes, yes, yes. But yeah. uh, one thing, if, if they live in oxygen depleted environment, then uh, uh, is there a great, uh, is there a strong evidence that, you know, reactive oxygen species are involved? Absolutely. There's a huge study in the reactive oxygen field, you know, using that seahorse, uh, technique, uh, the efforts are directed in um, uh, towards in uh, that area in cancer also. Yeah, if you someone you know your postdocs or your students can dig through, that way you can branch off and uh, apply whatever you bacteriology or the microbes can be applied. Actually, nowadays we all know applied biology is. Uh, going to be the future. So, yeah. Wait, I think now we are uh, eight minutes over the time. People probably waiting for us to start. I think uh, probably can we start now, sir? Yes. Okay, yes. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, uh, a very good evening uh, to. Uh, one and all present here. So um, today uh, in the evening session uh, for the webinar, uh, we have with us our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor K.R. Sambasiva Rao, who has been instrumental and uh, uh, in organizing these webinars of Mizoram University. And we have crossed um, nearly about more than 200 webinars uh, till today uh, and during this COVID pandemic time as well. And uh, uh, through his efforts and um, hard work, we have been able to contact uh, leading scientists and uh, researchers across the world in different areas of arts, science, engineering, and management, and uh, which has been very, very useful for uh, you know, the, all the researchers and students across the country as well as at the global level. So uh, in today's webinar, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Upender Mane, uh, who is going to, uh, who is working on a very, very important aspect of uh, cancer research, basically the uh, biomarker development in translational field of cancer research, which, ha which is a key uh, in many of the, uh, un in understanding the disease diagnosis as well as prognosis uh, factors. So I would like to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Upender uh, before he starts his talk. So uh, Dr. Upender Mane is a professor of pathology, uh, surgery and epidemiology, he is also the director of translational anatomic pathology section and as well the co-director of the UAB biorepository facility and a senior scientist of the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, as well as a senior scientist of the Minority Health Disparity Research Center of the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Alabama, USA. So uh, he received his post uh, baccalaureate de degree in uh, parasitology and doctoral degree in glucose metabolism from Osmania University, Hyderabad. He has undergone postdoctoral training in malaria immunology at uh, Malaria Research Center at the National Institute of Malaria Research under ICMR New Delhi and in mucosal immunology of the helicobacter at University of New South Wales in Australia. He, he also received a master's level diploma in bioinformatics from UAB. For more than 25 years at UAB, Dr. Mane's scientific career has been dedicated to translational research on human cancers. His research has centered on tumor molecular biology, cancer genetics, experimental therapeutics, discovery and validation of cancer markers for early detection, risk prognosis and prediction of therapy efficiency. And uh, uh, also, he has also worked on the racial and ethnic as well as population disparities in biology epidemiology and pathology of colorectal cancers, breast, oral, lung, and prostate cancers as well. He has published over 130 peer-reviewed manuscripts uh, uh, and 11 book chapters. He is an expert and leader in the field of population-based cancer biomarker studies. In 2009, he was part of the US President's Cancer Panel to address how uh, racial or ethnic 
admixtures affect the findings of molecular biomarker studies relating to cancer outcomes and contributed to the US President's Cancer Panel Annual Report 2010. Uh, till today, Dr. Mane has mentored more than 45 undergraduate, five medical, eight masters, seven graduate or PhD students, eight residents, 11 clinical fellows, 21 postdoctoral fellows, and 17 junior faculty members. In 2009, his mentoring skills were recognized by uh, Sir Charles Barclay Mentoring Excellence Award. Uh, he, he, had, he has received this award in 2009. Dr. Mane at UAB has been continuously funded uh, to the tune of more than uh, $56 million by the National Institute of Health, National Cancer Institute, the Komen Breast Cancer Foundation, and the American Cancer Society. So he currently serves as a principal investigator for grants funded under NIH, NCI, supporting and is supporting two large multi-center cancer research partnership with minor, uh, minority serving institutions. Goals of these partnerships are to attain excellence in basic and clinical research, education to increase the pool of next generation of researchers from diverse populations to work on cancer health disparities. Uh, his focus is also on uh, Southeast, uh, on reducing the cancer burden in the Southeast. In recognition of his scientific contributions, he received in 2010 an Innovator Award from the Alabama's Governor's Office and a Scientist Impacting Communities from the Alabama Indian Business Partnership Council. Dr. Mani is currently serving on several scientific advisory boards uh, under NIH and, and, and NCI, and also under MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, Wake Forest Baptist Comprehensive Cancer Center, and so on and so forth. And he also functions as an advisor of several institutional and departmental committees of UAB and other institutions. He also serves as an editor, as an associate editor, and on the editorial boards of several cancer research journals, and serve on various NIH oncology grant review committees. Uh, in 2018, Dr. Mane has received the Albert Loeb Bagillo Distinguished Faculty Award from the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center of UAB. So, uh, sir, we are really very uh, privileged to have your presence with us, and we are very happy uh, that uh, you have agreed to deliver us this talk, uh, which is very, very, I mean, going to be useful, uh, especially in the entire Indian context, as very few research institutions across the country actually focus on uh, the type of research that you have been doing for the past four or five decades. So it is uh, going to be a very useful talk for us. And thank you, sir, looking forward for your talk. Thank you very much. That is a very generous uh, acknowledgement or recognition to me. And I, it makes uh, uh, very pride, particularly in front of my home, uh, home, um, home country. So, uh, first of all, before I start the talk, I really thank Dr. K.R.S. Samshiro, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Missouri University, for extending this invitation. And uh, it's really an honor and pleasure uh, to talk to the students, scholars, uh, and the faculty. And also, today there are several um, others joined, even including some of my teachers who taught me when I was in master's. And uh, I really thank, and it's a really great pleasure. So with that, let me start my talk. So here are the outlines of my lecture. So I'm going to uh, touch a touch base on these uh, bullet points, uh, cancer path and a personal narrative. This I give always whenever I see the masters or PhD students or the, the, the faculty, junior faculty, those who are in um, uh, career development mode. So um, then sometimes, you know, you can learn a lessons from others' experiences. That's what smart people do. So I share that uh, to them to inspire as well as, you know, take home some message that what are the hardships and the benefits of going through uh, the, uh, when you are developing the uh, career of a um, uh, a reasonably a good uh, research uh, faculty or research uh, research career. So the cancer burden and the risk in the in the world, how the cancer is really, um, you know, as far as the incidences and deaths are concerned, and also what are the risk factors. 
every region, every country has their own set of risk factors. And then how to take uh, the advantage of these molecular alterations and bring them to the clinic. So in those efforts, uh, there are uh, several investigators in the world working on translating these laboratory findings to the clinic. And particularly uh, for that translation, translating the biomarker, biomarker means how to utilize these genetic alterations uh, for the um, patient care. Um, then discuss the strategies. I'm going to talk about how to design or what are the steps we go through in order to bring lab uh, discovery uh, to the clinical practice. And also we need to integrate these discoveries with other aspects of uh, the cancer care. It's not always biology, biology, biology. There are several other aspects like socioeconomic factors and the patient care, the physician expertise. So those are the other factors which are going to influence uh, the outcome of the cancer patients. So here, the career path, quickly I'll go through this. I did my master's as Dr. Sintil Kumar uh, introduced, uh, mentioned in my introduction. Um, you know, started career in zoology as a major and with a specialization in parapsychology and zoonotic diseases. I would like to mention particularly for the master's students and the, uh, the graduate students that, you know, zoonotic diseases when we were in the college, I did not pay much attention. You know, is it really relevant to the present day knowledge? How I'm going to utilize for my uh, career advancement or whatever I'm going to do after obtaining my master's degree. But let me tell you today, uh, whatever I learned in my master's or PhD, they're all very useful somewhere down the line in my career path. You know, today the best example is our coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 infection is a zoonotic disease, which is coming from animals to the human. Very rarely that type of infections become more virulent and cause the damage. And this is the best example we have now. And that's not the best, but that's the worst um, uh, to the society. Uh, but that is the example of uh, zoonotic diseases. And then move to the PhD uh, program and particularly focused on parasite biochemistry because at that time in my university, <coughs> excuse me, majority of the professors were parasitologists. So um, the emphasis was on parasitology and I happened to join um, a faculty member, Dr. Uh, um, G. V. Ramakrishna, uh, who was mentored by another a very well-known elementologist. So I worked on a parasites, particularly these um, cestoid parasite, which lives in the alimentary canal of uh, the chicken or the fowl. And since it is living in oxygen depleted condition and uh, they do not have their own digestive tract, they absorb the food from the host that is fowl intestine and how those nutrients are taken into the parasite. So uh, during the process and you know, a body wall, as we know today is very well established and that the nutrients from the host take it into the body through the body wall. And there are specific enzymes which shuttle uh, between uh, within the membrane, within the body wall, you know, communicating to the outside environment of the parasite that is a lumen of the uh, fowl and bring them into uh, the uh, parasite for its metabolism. So since it is living in oxygen depleted condition and the standard glycolysis and Krebs cycle and electron transport system may not take place. And there is an alternative pathway for this, for the energy production that is HMP shunt, exos monophosphate shunt, which is less efficient in energy production. It produces uh, two NADPH, meaning ab about six ATP molecules instead of 38 in the presence of oxygen. So that was the biochemistry background and uh, underwent uh, training in, in that area. So with that background, when I, I joined Malaria Research Institute because of the parasite background, 
then I was thinking of uh, moving uh, forward or in, uh, in search of advancing the uh, career, I ended up in Delhi and started looking for the position. Then at that time, there was a young uh, couple came from the United States back to Delhi, the wife and husband, um, Dr. Rajiv Saxena, I think he was a vice chancellor of uh, Sark um, uh, University and his wife, Queen Saxena, she's a parasitologist. So I joined her in the Indian Council of Medical Research and her area of interest is malaria immunology. Look at it, parasitology, zoonosis, parasite biochemistry, now switch to immunology, absolutely brand new area, and started learning uh, from the beginning, what is T cell, what is B cell, how the antibodies are produced, how the cytokines and lymphokines are produced in malarial, in malarial infections. So it's entirely a brand new field. Again, started as a career and started learning those tricks and the techniques. And particularly, I worked on mirosoid surface antigen characterization, meaning the parasite has different isolates. So the samples were coming from all parts of India and on filter papers, you know, in those days, blood drops taken in filter paper and you punch them, elute the antibodies and screen them against this mirosite surface antigen for isolated from different isolates of parasites. And those efforts are for the development of the vaccine. You know, even today, I do not see an ineffective vaccine for malarial infection because par developing vaccines for parasites is very tough compared to viruses and bacteria, uh, but uh, that's what my training, and I was uh, uh, exposed to uh, the immunology. So during this time, I had an opportunity uh, to go to Australia and present my work uh, at uh, uh, Queensland Institute of Medical Research in uh, Brisbane. And, uh, and that exposure gave her an opportunity to interact with uh, uh, the leading scientist in malaria, particularly immunology. However, I ended up in uh, a mucosal immunology laboratory at University of New South Wales, Sydney. And this group is an outstanding group. There actually I uh, started learning what is the rigors of, uh, what are the rigors of the science? What are the things we need to incorporate when you are designing the studies? And that exposure really helped me a lot. And this professor, uh, Professor Adrian Lee, um, he was uh, a close collaborator of the Nobel laureate uh, in, uh, um, from Western Sydney, Western Australia, Perth, uh, Dr. Barry Marshall and Dr. Adrian Lee are the close collaborators. So in that, uh, in that team, I joined as a, a researcher and then started working on immunology, but it's completely different immunology that is mucosal immunology. Whatever I learned in malaria, that was T and B cell immunology. And here is a mucosal immunology, meaning IgA, it plays a vital role in mucosal immunology. So the notion at that time, um, the stress, what we go through is because of, um, uh, sorry, the burning sensation, what we have, what we get is because of the stress. However, this gastroenterologist, Dr. Betty Marshall, is the one first identified that it's not the stress, there is a bacteria or bacterium causing this um, um, burning sensation in the stomach that is due to the infection of Helicobacter pylori, which is a Campylobacter family of uh, bacteria. And he swallowed the bacteria himself and proved that indeed this bacteria colonizes the antral part of the stomach. So this is, I don't know whether you see the cursor I am moving here. This is the lower part of the stomach. This is cardiac part, this is the upper part of the stomach, but this bacteria specifically localizes in the antral part. And um, uh, there are a lot of experiments we have conducted in animal models. And there is a, a animal model for this bacteria that is Helicobacter felix. And that's what we used uh, to conduct these uh, ex experiments. 
And this is really interesting, a serendipitous finding. They identified, uh, you know, uh, and ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Um, this gentleman, Dr. Barry Marshall, a technician, um, you know, he left some bacteria growing in petri dishes before the, the Christmas break, uh, because he's a gastroenterologist. You know, he's curious to know what's happening in different parts of the stomach. Uh, whether these bacteria are growing in which part of the anatomic location. So then he takes biopsies and sent to his lab and the technician grows them in petri dishes. And um, uh, uh, his, uh, one of the technicians forgot to clean the hood before going on vacation. And when he comes back in January first week, then he saw a lot of growth in those bacteria. And he was about to throw away because, you know, mentor or the supervisor may feel bad. Uh, but look at it, how the, the timings, this professor, he saw while he was throwing, he said, hey, hold on, there is something there. Then he took it, scrapped it, looked under the microscope, and there are some spherical shaped bacteria float, uh, uh, he found that eventually they characterized and, uh, uh, you know, uh, eventually he got the Nobel Prize because he swallowed, as I said in the beginning, and treated himself with the triple antibodies, uh, antibiotics, and therefore uh, that award he received. Uh, however, the most of the immunology work, most of the biology work he did in collaboration with uh, the basic biology. That's what one of my professors with whom I worked, Adrian Lee, is um, part of the team. So. Now, from mucosal immunology, during that time, I might have sacrificed thousands of animals and you know, what we did, the, uh, the best finding we had at the time is we isolated a uh, an enzyme helico uh, catalase from this bacteria, which is a human homologue, meaning it has homology with the human catalase enzyme. And we took that enzyme coupled with the chlorotoxin P unit combined with it, then orally we um, inject, uh, not inject, orally we gave uh, uh, this cocktail and that cocktail of chlorotoxin B unit and catalase enzyme success, successfully eradicated established infections. Therefore, those findings we published uh, in Lancet. Now, during that process, we collected these biopsies from the animals. What is happening, these chronic infections? So when we uh, did the sectioning and under the microscope, we started finding infiltration of lymphocytes. There are a lot of ulcerations. There's a damage to the epithelium. Is it really causing to the, uh, leading to the development of the gastric cancers? That was a question. But at that time, there was no direct um, uh, association or no findings demonstrating that Helicobacter um, is responsible for uh, gastric cancers. However, from Japan, Japan, Indonesia, and from the Southeast uh, region, a lot of epidemiological associations were published showing that Helicobacter infection higher incidence with the gastric cancer. Just now, Dr. Sintil Kumar, he was mentioning that in your Mizoram area, um, the gastric cancers are one of the highest um, uh, cancers in, the, in that region. And also he said the risk factors are Helicobacter and HB, EBVs. So, because in India, now the epidemiological studies uh, clearly show that more than 70 to 80% of individuals are exposed, infected with this Helicobacter pylori because this is oral fecal contamination, water contamination is responsible uh, for these helicobacter infections. Therefore, some parts of the country, uh, the gastric cancers are very high where the contaminated water is taken in. So with this background, because of the interest in cancer and this project which was funded uh, by a pharmaceutical company in Australia, Commonwealth Serum Laboratories, they tied up with a company in Boston, Mass, Massachusetts, and they said, hey, this job is ending. So if you want to continue in our lab, but I cannot give you this faculty position, I'll give you some 
in a research position or a postdoctoral position, or if you want to go uh, to that company and explore yourself, uh, if they are interested to hire you. Then I was, after spending four years in Australia, then moving the family, I was, uh, you know, it was a really a tough decision to uh, dismantle the fa family again. But I took a challenge, then I came to the United States, presented there, that did not materialize, but it's a long story short, I happened to meet some uh, the cancer center director of UAB and a pathologist there in a meeting in Boston and eventually ended up in University of Alabama at Birmingham and started working on cancer. Because they said, hey, come over, come to Birmingham and give a talk, we'll see. Then when I presented this helicobacter related gastric cancer initiation, probably at that time we have not proved in animal models thoroughly. And they were you know, impressed and they said, well, you know, infection induced cancers are really interesting and emerging field of uh, cancer area. We would like to have you here. So that's the reason I ended up in Birmingham, Alabama. Look at the journey, Hyderabad, Delhi, Sydney, Boston, and to Birmingham. So keep changing the field. But however, I want to tell my young students and young fellows that in science, nothing is absolute. Whatever I learned at every step, simple immunohistochemistry, that's what my focus was. I start, uh, immunocytochemistry, immunohistochemistry, hist those are my techniques I learned during my master's that I used in malaria research. Those techniques I learned in malaria applied in helicobacter research. And that, uh, that histology, uh, what I learned and what are the, the vaccine development strategies in helicobacter, I apply today, even today in cancer. So therefore, the knowledge of what you gain in the process of your career is not going to go waste. That is the lesson, but the hardship. I know I'm not going into that area, how tough it was and family, with little kids moving from one place to the other is a huge challenge. But at the end of the day, I have no regrets. That is, uh, as far as uh, my narrative is concerned, hope some lessons uh, can be learned from my experiences by those young minds. Now, moving into the cancer research, what is cancer? Now I spent more than now 25, 26 years in the field of uh, uh, cancer. And if you look into this as uh, statistics, it's a very um, uh, deteriorating situation. It is, a health, it, it is a healthcare problem, which is claiming more lives than HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Look at it. We always talk because infectious diseases are very common in mostly uh, in developing countries or low-income and middle-income countries, uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia and some of the uh, South American countries, but the cancer incidence is higher than those all combined. And look at these statistics, very devastating. Nine, uh, about 18 cancer patients are dying per minute in the world. And they are projecting now that by 2025, this death rate will go up about 22 cancer patients are dying per minute. These are all statistical modeling based on the data input come from the WHO. And also they are projecting that um, in these low and middle income countries, um, over hundred million people are going to die in the next five to seven years. And in the world, if you take the whole cancer burden, 50% of the cancers are 50% of the cancer load or the burden is coming from lung cancer, breast cancers, prostate, and the gastrointestinal cancers. Because, you know, lung cancer, smoking, exposure to environmental hazards, breast cancer, similarly, same environmental factors, prostate cancer, lifestyle, gastrointestinal cancers, various viral infections, and the lifestyles, alcohol, I'll give you uh, so I'll show you in a different slide the risk factors associated with these cancers. And also, this is a worrying trend. 
in, in the world, what's happening? Pancreas and liver cancers in males and uterine cancers and liver cancers in females are increasing more than, uh, like a doubling in every four to five years. And pancreatic cancers and liver cancers are most um, aggressive lesions of aggressive cancers compared to other solid tumors. Like for example, prostate cancer is not a, un, it can be detected early and majority, most of the times, but they are slow growing tumors. So patient won't die um, within one to two years after diagnosis with a prostate cancer. They live five to six years if they are diagnosed at the late stage, but in the early stage, they can live up to 20 years or 25 years. However, the pancreatic cancer, liver cancers are very aggressive. The pancreatic cancer median uh, uh, survival is uh, 18 months, very aggressive. So therefore, um, but those aggressive cancers are increasing in the world for various reasons, particularly the chronic inflammation is one of the major causes. So the cancer burden in India, it is increasing. Earlier, they thought that you know, if, if you look at this figure, this red is low incidence, fifth in the rank, you look at it blue, the Western world is the highest as far as cancer incidences are concerned. New Zealand, Australia, Europe, North America and South America, particularly this Peru and uh, uh, Southern Brazil. But India, if you see, is red, meaning when compared to the world, cancer incidences, we are less. However, in the last 10 to 15 years, it is doubling or tripling. The cancer deaths are increasing. And these are the topmost five cancers in India. Breast cancer, oral cancer, that is attributed to uh, the chewing tobacco and cigarettes and tambaku, and cervical cancers, HPV infections, gastric cancers, just now we were talking about this helicobacter infection is one of the major culprits for the gastric cancer, infection, uh, gastric cancer. And the lung cancers, of course, again, smoking. And um, there are some regions in India, the bladder cancer is also increasing. Remember, everyone thinks that, oh, the smoking is directly associated with the lung cancer, but the second highest incidence of cancers that are directly correlated with uh, smoking um, are the bladder cancers, bladder and smoking, and also the large bowel. Colorectal cancers are also associated with the smoking and the alcohol intake. Alcohol intake mainly for the liver and pancreas. So the cancer is a disease of aging. Look at, this is a very interesting slide for me. Um, the cancer incidences usually increases from age 45 onwards. And the peak, it reaches when you are between 65 to 75 years. Then slowly it goes down. Why? You know, older the patients, you should, you expect this is higher incidence of cancers, but not. Why? Meaning if someone is surviving that long, their genetic makeup is solid, strong enough, or they have good genes in a generic terminology. And they uh, the, these cancers, even the seven to eight percent of cancers we are I, we found uh, find in um, uh, older patients are because of aging process may not be because of this uh, the genetic factor. I mean the um, uh, exposures. So now less than thirty five or forty five, some of them actually this group between to twenty to forty five are hereditary or um, familial cancers. So uh, like, for example, uh, pancreatic cancer, endometrial cancers, uh, breast cancers are hereditary slash familial. And we know that what is hereditary directly related uh, to the, our parents uh, because of uh, the mutate, uh, ge genetic makeup or the familial means in your family circle, means your mom's side or dad's side, as some of them might have had some sort of cancers. And because of, again, um, uh, they are attributed to the um, uh, parents, but may not be directly in the parents' family, but they are the uncles and aunts of moms and dads. Those are contributing 
uh, for those uh, familial cancers. And here are the risk factors. You know, now a worrying, worrying trend in India is, um, you know, um, intake of this, for, uh, uh, this junk food, uh, burgers, um, the Western style diet is really contributing for this increased incidence in cancers. So these are all red meat and the sodas, not good at all because sugar intake, sugar increase and subsequent events at the um, molecular level and HPV, HCV and HIV, even HIV infections are really uh, increasing some certain types of cancers in HIV patients. Of course, alcohol intake, you know, cirrhotic liver, cirrhosis, and that is a pre-malignant condition for the hepatocellular carcinomas are the liver cancers, as I said, smoking and excessive uh, salty foods, uh, including you know chips and this uh, salted uh, pickles, um, you know is a common sense. When you create an insult, physiological insult to your um, genetic milieu, that causes damage to the DNA, and the DNA damage damaged DNA consisting cells will proliferate rapid and they become cancerous. So that's what we need to avoid these bad foods. And here are uh, the good food or good um, uh, dietary components, like sulforaphane, which is a main ingredient of uh, uh, the crucifer family, cabbage, cauliflower, those are the, um, what you call cancer preventive agents are present in those foods. So the intake will delay if you are at risk already for the developing cancer, but they can delay the process and also prevent because there are a lot of uh, uh, preventive agents present in it. But all fats are not bad. Look at it, fats coming from fish, nuts, and uh, avocados are good fats compared to these pizzas and various types of uh, uh, these junk food will have these bad foods. So we have to be very careful. And particularly if you have a history, a family history, uh, of cancer, you know, try to maintain or stick to your strict, a good diet regimen. Now, how the cancer develops? Cancer is not developing within a year or two. Every cancer takes its own time. Look at this. If you see the different types of cancers, it takes ages. It's a minimum 20 to 30 years by the time the cancer is diagnosed. And initially, you know, this is a normal, a normal epithelium of any organ. This blue cell is a cell with a damaged DNA. How the damage has occurred, I told you previously, the risk factors, if you are exposed to any of those risk factors, if they cause the DNA damage, if the DNA damage consisting cell that, is, that acquires higher proliferative quality, cell proliferation means, Cell division is rapid and look at this and slowly this one cell is becoming, growing rapidly and becoming ball of cells, cancer cells. And eventually, you know, these cells um, getting extra blood supply that is neogenesis and eventually they become invasive cancers, meaning slowly the cancer is spreading to the different parts of the body. And the message from this slide is, Cancer is not developing in one, two years. It takes ages, particularly look at this, a colon cancer, 20 years here, 15 years, 45 years. Meaning if you are diagnosed with cancer in mid fifties or mid sixties, you might have started causing damage 20 to 30 years prior to the diagnosis. Meaning 20, 25 years when you are old, that time you are, have uh, you, uh, the cancer started developing, but you cannot detect those early cancers. It is impossible at this, at this age. Now, if you have a familiar history, then you are under surveillance, then you undergo certain tests, but normal individual, when the life is going smoothly, why he goes and gets these tests done? That's not practically possible. Therefore, I say that it's very difficult um, to identify those early lesions are early uh, cancer uh, cancers. So you have to be careful from 
uh, right from childhood. So, and even now there are some evidences that during embryonic phase itself, you know, when cell becomes fertilized as zygote, proliferates and becomes embryo, when the embryogenesis start taking place, at that time, some cells determined to become malignant. There are some reports coming out. Meaning is not, not only this exposure, also you are imprinted uh, with this cancer development way in embryonic stage. So that's what the, uh, uh, the re recent advances are um, explaining to us. And it is a very complex and heterogeneous disease. Meaning if you take this picture, that head, look at it, how many colors are in it? Meaning if you think that this is one tumor, like it's a breast cancer or the prostate cancer or the colon cancer, if you take that lump, within that lump, you find different varieties of cells. That is clonality in, in, in a technical term. So look at every piece, in this is a, is a considered as a cell, if you consider as a cell, and every cell has a different genetic makeup sometimes, multi, multi clones. So if you to start treating particularly this cell, and the other cells may not respond to the therapy. So even though you are killing some cells, but you are not killing the whole, uh, all cells in a tumor. So this is the best, and I took this picture when I was flying through Bombay a couple of years ago. And, and also the cancer is different in different populations. Means I take a colon cancer diagnosed in the United States and the colon cancer patient in Mizoram may be completely distinctly different because even though it's developing in, in colon, but because of the exposures that uh, uh, the individual in Mizoram are distinctly different compared to the molecular alterations we find in patients in the United States. So that is a population. And again, race, ethnic, because a lot of single nucleotide polymorphisms are distinctly uh, different from race to race. And our race, ethnic um, uh, changes are also uh, contributing to the uh, development of cancers and the progression of the cancer. And as I said, infections and carcinogens we exposed and lifestyles, geography, the natural environment, and the social and cultural um, uh, and economic factors also um, contribute to the development of the cancer. Like for example, you know, uh, economic, of course, if you're poor, you live in a poor neighborhood, which is, you know, car environmental carcinogen, like, you know, some small huts, juggy jopedies living in next to the dumpsters of garbage, they have a lot of arsenic exposure, a lot of other environmental carcinogenic exposures, naturally they, they, uh, that will cause the damage to uh, the, um, the um, uh, DNA in those patients and you have mutations and those mutations leading to the development of the cancer. And of course, biology. All these are interlinked. They are not studied in isolation, but for our convenience as scientists, we, it is impossible to study all these aspects at the same time. So therefore, everyone picks their interested area and uh, uh, however, eventually the biology, which is responsible for the initiation and the progression of the disease. And my laboratory particularly works on different areas. In the last 25 years, we developed a nice program here in the cancer biomarker development and validation. So you identify some molecules, but whether those molecules are important only for the study, uh, studying the biology of the cancer, or can we use those molecular alterations to determine the uh, outcomes of the patients? I will go into the details. That is a part I'm going to uh, go, into, uh, go into details and show some data. And also we worked extensively on different molecular targets, identifying the molecular targets, meaning these are novel targets like TRIP13, P4H1. Most of them are enzymes. Enzymes are, if they are overexpressed in tumors, but not in the normal, so that you can develop some inhibitors and then specifically you can kill the tumor cells. That's called precision medicine. So uh, there we spend a lot of time, but today I'm going to show just one example of this P53 molecule. 
and also because of my interest in computational biology and uh, bioinformatics, um, I incorporated the things what I studied and learned and applied in cancer research. And we used all these techniques like decision trees, neural networks, clustering, statistical and visualizations, and in the discovery and validation of biomarkers and also the computational biology. This I am going to show a little bit, a couple of slides and explain how we identified uh, these, um, the aggressive pathways when the, uh, how they are keep changing when the tumor grows from early stage to the late stage. And we, I've actually, out of my seven PhDs I produced, five of them are from cancer epidemiology, even though I'm a biologist, but my PhD students are uh, graduated, I means uh, came out of this program, cancer epidemiology. Because during this process, we developed a lot of large, huge databases. I developed 28,000 colon cancer database here at UAB with fully annotated um, uh, for all the features. and these students came up with an interesting, you know, several interesting questions and they keep addressing and obtain their PhDs. And the cancer prevention, this is another area we focused on. And now recently we started working on microbiome, getting samples from different parts of Africa and United States and screening. And because microbiome, millions of bacteria living in the gut because I'm interested in gut bacteria, you know, bacteria can also live in heart, liver, lung, brain, in different parts of the organs. But since I am focusing on GI malign gastrointestinal cancers, and I am interested in, in the microbiomes, very interesting findings we are observing. And also going beyond the cancer, like um, like for example, I'll give you an example: uh, chronic kidney diseases in India. Also, you have a lot of di dialysis patients because of the uh, kidney failure, and we go, uh, the patients undergo the dialysis every one week or two weeks. And those patients, what we did when we were collecting the databases from different uh, publicly available uh, domains, we found very interesting finding, and these have not published yet, and we are working on the manuscript, um, that chronic kidney disease patients are at increased risk of colon cancer what type of association it is. And we are looking into the cellular level and bringing some animal models and cause the kidney damages and see how that is uh, uh, interacting with the development of the colon cancer. Look at it, kidney is different, colon, uh, by large bowel is different, but that's what I was telling in the beginning. Every organ, uh, they're all interconnected, but for our convenience, we isolate them and study. And that is another area I'm focusing. But for the last 15, 20 years, this is the large program I developed here at UAB. And we, using all these techniques, whatever we learned in the, in the laboratory, computational level, or in the community level, we brought into this and formed some, we established uh, partnerships with different schools, uh, minority serving schools. Why minority? Because in the United States, these minority patients means African-Americans and Hispanics, they are at increased risk of cancer, not only because of some genetic underlying features, because of socioeconomic factors. So here, US government puts a lot of money into this, how to reduce this gap, cancer um, disparities between uh, whites and African-Americans and Hispanics. And in those efforts, we developed a very successful program uh, programs and we established um, several partnerships in the Southeast, right from Texas to Virginia and um, Georgia. That is our next state, uh, Atlanta, he is in Georgia and uh, Alabama State University and Moorhouse School of Medicine uh, in Atlanta. And this is uh, ongoing a research partnership. There we have training, education, basic research, community outreach, and we put together all these multi-components, how to reduce the cancer incidence. And amazing, we have done um, colon cancer screenings, cervical cancer screenings, lung cancer screenings, and identifying these patients early enough so that they can uh, undergo these interventions and the survival can be uh, increased. So those are 
are the major programs in my laboratory. Now, for this talk, I'm going to focus on cancer biomarkers and why these cancer biomarkers, where they are helpful, they are mainly useful for the precision medicine. And what is precision? So uh, what, today, the cancer care decisions are made based on this, meaning the knowledge and practice elicit and practice physician tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge means I am an expert, you know, very, um, what you call from the experience, this physician understands certain things. Hey, during this season, if people are coming with these symptoms, more likely, oh, it is malaria. Every alternate day, this gentleman is getting, or this person is getting fever, and that fever lasts for two, three, four hours, then goes down. That's what, that's the reason doctor asks all these questions first. Then he, he, he comes up with his own algorithm that, oh, this is malaria, then prescribes. Because doing conducting this test in rural area is very expensive. Therefore, the doctors practice symptom-based uh, um, uh, uh, symptom decisions they make and start treating. And that's not wrong. I'm not telling that that is a wrong approach, but that is unorganized, undocumented, meaning that very well-experienced physician, if passes away, He's not training, he's not passing out that knowledge to the next generations. And those decisions, what he made are symptom-based rather than um, underlying molecular changes. Uh, therefore, uh, that is one way of uh, making the cancer care decisions. And the another is evidence-based, precisely looking into the patient. Okay, if this is the case, here, here are the symptoms, those symptoms may overlap with multiple diseases. So therefore here, they do a lot of tests in the hospital, uh, in the medical centers. That's not possible in developing countries. Why? With the limited resources, socioeconomic status, there are a lot of other factors. So that here, particularly in case of cancer, before putting a patient on any therapy or regimen, they make all this molecular profiling first. Then, for example, I'll give you in colon cancer. First, they give 5-fluorouracil, that is a standard drug. If it is stage two, stage three, they inject. But what happens that the drug in some patients, a very small proportion of patients, that drug is efficacious. But majority of the patients, they develop resistance to the drug and they come back with the recurrence. Then what they do, they do second line of therapy, meaning they go take the biopsy, and look it into some mutations. If there is a mutation in KRAS, they do not give a second line therapy arbutex. I'm giving an example. So that type of decision making is done based on the molecular profiles of the patient taken and identified in their biopsies. And now, this is all great. I know you have a lot of discoveries made in the lab. How to bring them to the patient care? That is a huge challenge. If you look at it, you know, throughout the world, thousands and thousands of hundreds of la uh, laboratories are working on cancer. But all the, someone says, I, I, I write a beautiful paper, here you go, we identified this X molecule or Y molecule, and it is a potential, uh, it has a potential um, to predict the patient outcome or this a response to therapy, but that's not used in clinical practice. Why? Bringing from those discoveries from the laboratory to the patient care is a huge science altogether. It's a arduous journey from that place to this uh, bringing to the clinic. It's a long journey. Why? Of, uh, so because of various, various factors. I will show some slides uh, uh, later uh, to explain that concept. So the translational research involves two types or two types of translational research. One is directly bringing like bench to bedside. I'm sure you might have heard this word, like you identified some mutation and you are trying to bring that, those discoveries to the bench that's called type one translation. Type two translation is community-based translation, meaning now drug is developed, government released these guidelines and those guidelines are followed mainly in the tertiary medical centers, meaning the aims in India, in Indian context, aims are some regional government hospitals or the large 
uh, hospitals in big, big cities. But if you go and see the interior um, uh, uh, places, the clinician follows the same what he learned in medical school and what he uh, learned from sales reps. They come and explain, sir, this is a new drug came. And if you see these symptoms, then because he doesn't have time to ask the patient to undergo those tests or implement himself. So if someone does this research, educating the clinicians in the community, that is a community-based translational research, or you are educating or bringing awareness in the public about this cancer screening. Suppose a, one of your social scientists in your university, if he conducts a research that cancer awareness, develop some pamphlets, take them to the barber shops, uh, where the people sit together and gossip whole day, or go to churches or the temples or the majids and Fridays and Sundays and Tuesdays or whatever, start distributing these pamphlets. Sir, if you are 50 year old, undergo the colonoscopy in order to detect the colon cancer early enough. Or you go to these beauty parlors where women go very often, explain them, tell them that, ma'am, you are 45 year old, you are, um, uh, you need to undergo a pap smear, you know, from the cervix, they scrap it and put it on a slide and check under the microscope and if the tumor cells are there. So that type of screening modalities, if you are explaining and educating the community, that type of research is classified or categorized as a type two translation. Now, for the precision medicine means precisely looking at the molecular profiles of a patient you treat the patient, for that you need some tools. And those tools are biomarkers. And what are biomarkers? This is the definition of the NCI NIH in the United States. It's a, a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses to a therapeutic, uh, therapeutic intervention, meaning, by looking at that molecular alteration, if you can predict how the tumor is going to progress, that is pathologic process, then those can be categorized as biomarkers. Now, these biomarkers can be produced by the cancer cell. This is a large cancer cell. Look at it, this bottom one red cell, the cancer cell. Usually the normal cells are nice, nice in the sense the cell wall is defined, centrally located nucleus, with a large, large amount of cytoplasm, but the cancer cell is gigantic, bigger in size and irregular membrane, and it produces tons of abnormal molecules. Because the cell, when you compare normal cell to cancer cell, I said earlier, the cancer cell proliferates at a rapid rate. So it needs everything in large amounts. And during this process, it acquires, produces large amounts of proteins, RNAs, and uh, other uh, you know, lipids in order to form the new cells or new membranes. And uh, during that process, uh, these cancer cells, when they divide and release some contents, and also the cancer cells more sensitive than the normal cells, because the general notion is, oh, we think that, oh, cancer is tough. It's very difficult to kill. That's not true. Actually, normal cells are tough, tough in the sense they can withstand the physiological insult, but Cancer cells cannot withstand. They are lily, like a very delicate um, lily flowers. So they, they break down or they collapse quickly or they die. Uh, they are very sensitive uh, to the physiological insult. Therefore, during this process, when they die, kill, uh, they are killed, these, nutri these uh, components into the blood and you can measure them. Uh, it can be circulating tumor DNA, circulating tumor cells, uh, DNA, RNA, microRNA, any of those molecules, if you are using them as tools to measure and uh, a link with the clinical outcome, and those are called the biomarkers. Now, the cancer progression. As I said, again, here in the pictorial way, cancer initiated way back several decades ago. By the, you know, it is indolent, means not detectable for several decades. By the time it is detected, this is the detection point, means there you are diagnosed with cancer, but it takes several, uh, it is growing, but you cannot detect. 
But if you have a marker to measure early enough so that you can catch this cancer and you can be under surveillance and you can undergo some sort of preventive measures. And if you are using a molecule to assess whether you are at risk for developing cancer or not, they are called risk biomarkers. The best example is BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations you might have heard for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. What they are doing now, they, won't, they are doing this type of screening for the high-risk patients if they have familial or hereditary background, meaning if your grandmother is diagnosed with breast cancer and the daughter is also diagnosed with breast cancer and granddaughter is also diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, sorry, not detected yet, granddaughter. So now the granddaughter is at risk for developing breast cancer because of this family history. Then what they are doing, even the child is about 18 year old or 20 year old, they go and take a biopsy from the breast and see whether that BRCA1 is a gene, BRCA2, if those mutations are present in those genes and they say, this girl is going to develop a breast cancer. However, put under surveillance so that they can undergo certain therapies or some sort of preventive or therapeutic intervention mean surgeries. They can remove, keep checking the breast with mammograms and before the cancer develops, they remove those uh, lumps or the uh, nodules. So that type of intervention, those BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations are risk biomarkers. Early detection. Best example is colonoscopy. You know, when you are 45, 50 year old, you undergo, you are healthy, absolutely no issues, but still I suggest everyone, at least these listeners, maybe 100, 200 people are attending this. If they are more than 50 year old or around 48, 50 year old, start going to the gastroenterologist, take an appointment, undergo this colon cancer screening. What they do, you know, you need to prep the colon, drink all that, you know, liquid of two, three liters. Then you will, you will go to the bathroom very often and completely you clear the bubble. And next day morning, the gastroenterologist, you put a scope and checks the whole colon, whether there is any abnormality or cancer developing or not that type of intervention. During that time, what they find, majority of the patients, those who are 50s and 60s, you develop polyps. Polyps are early malignant, early neoplastic lesions, meaning if you do not remove this gastroenterologist, if they identify those polyps, they pluck it and they remove it. So if you do not remove, some of these polyps may become cancerous. And those polyps, or the colonoscopy tool, that procedure can be an early detection um, modality. So, and also prostate cancer, you know, PSA. I'm sure now in India, a lot of these diagnostic medical centers have the, with the schemes of, sir, you know, if you pay certain X amount of uh, dollars, uh, rupees per year, um, uh, we will do this test, that test free, take that. That is an advantage because they routinely do certain tests that will save you or protect you from developing some sort of cancers. And in that scheme, they may have this um, prostate cancer. What they do, they don't do this type of invasive procedure. Simply they collect the blood, check the PSA and uh, prostatic specific antigen. They measure in ELISA or whatever the diagnostic kit they have and they detect and say, sir, your PSA levels are high meaning you are at risk for developing uh, prostate cancer. However, PSA sensitivity uh, specificity is not that great. Means it's only 25% of those high levels of PSA patients are really having um, um, a prostate cancer. That's not a perfect marker, but there is no other marker. Therefore, they are using the uh, prostate check, uh, PSA measures in the blood. Then once cancer is diagnosed, what happens, the, um, uh, the radiologist or the gastroenterologist, they go and take a biopsy and send to a pathologist. Pathologist, they cut the sections, check under the microscope, and they diagnose whether it is a tumor or not. For most of the solid tumors, is a straightforward diagnosis by pathologist. However, some hematological malignancies are very difficult to diagnose whether the tumor cells are there or not. Therefore, you need some help from the biomarkers. 
So if you are using a biomarker to diagnose whether it is a tumor or not, those type of uh, those biomarkers are called diagnostic biomarkers. And if you are using these biomarkers to assess the progression, now what happens? Cancer is diagnosed and you are under the treatment, means you are under uh, the therapy. So if you give drugs or the treatment to the patient, some patients, they maintain the stable disease. Some patients respond to the therapy and the tumor shrinks in the CT scans, or in some, some patients do not respond to the therapy at all. They keep progressing, the tumor is stable, keep growing. And these patients are more aggressive. They are not going to respond to any therapy and they are going to die. Why? Same drug is given. For example, in colon cancer, I gave you 5 fluorouracil Some patients go follow this path. Some people progression, some people respond. That is because of the underlying heterogeneity in the, at the genetic level. So even if the responders, they respond, what happens after some time, this drug, as long as the drug pressure is there, the tumor is growing slowly, but after some time, those patients are also developing resistance to the drug, resistance to the drug. Then slowly tumor starts coming up. That is called recurrence. That's what they say. I went to the doctor, he removed the tumor. I was on chemotherapy five, six years, I'm happy. But again, after six, seven years started developing, the secondary nodules means metastasis started occurring or locally developing. Then you go again to the doctor and they do the second line of therapy. So that is the, the standard practice or the disease progression. And <clears throat> if you are using a biomarker or a protein or a mutation or some sort of genetic alteration, to predict whether X drug is going to work for that patient or not, that type of biomarkers are called predictive biomarkers. And if you are measuring how long this patient is going to survive, I don't care because it's a stage two, I don't want to undergo this chemotherapy because chemotherapy is not fun. So, so chemotherapy, I don't want to because I'm already 75 year old. I, I don't want to put my body under that pressure. So I want to live happily. Can, can someone help me how long I'm going to survive? If, if there is a marker for that cancer, if they are using that marker to predict the survival, recurrence, and the relapse of the disease, those are called prognostic biomarkers. I'm giving this terminology for the scientific background people because when you write a grant, when you write a paper, when I review the paper, very first paragraph or first page itself tells that what type of scientist you are. Are you an expert in the field? or you are just entering into it because all these words, terminologies, they used very loosely, prediction one place, prognosis one place, uh, you know, therefore as a scientist, careful in usage of this terminology. If you are using um, like, you know, surveillance, I said BRCA1, BRCA2, those are surveillance or risk biomarkers. So based on the utility, they are characterized and uh, um, um, precisely provided some sort of nomenclature uh, in relation to the tumor growth. Now, I will explain what we have done in several years. Just in one molecule, I'm going to give a story by taking this example, colon cancer. What is colon cancer? This is stomach, small intestine, then the cecum, this is appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum and here the anus. And now, even today, surgeons, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, they deem this whole tube as a single organ. Oh, this is large bowel cancer. Doesn't matter whether the tumor develops here, 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 here. They give the same therapy because there are no anatomic location specific therapy modalities available today. But extensive research has been done that the tube, even though this is a single tube, the tumors developed in the proximal tumors are distinctly different molecularly compared to the transverse colon, compared to the distal colon, or the anatomic, uh, the other parts of the anatomic uh, locations of the colorectum. Why? When the food taken in within 30 to 45 minutes, it's digested, goes through jejunum, then the small intestine food absorption, and it comes 
to the this proximal colon. Proximal colon is wide and is fluidy, and the food, this digested or undigested food, stays there for about three to four hours. Meaning, the carcinogenic insult or the exposure to the linings of this part is longer. So there is a scope that the DNA damage in the epithelial lining of this colon is higher because the food, the dietary carcinogens are staying for three to four hours and the water is absorbed in the proximal colon and slowly it goes through the feces, passes through this. By the time it reaches to the descending colon rectum and it is defecated within 30 to 40 minutes. So here the carcinogenic exposure is less. So there's a less chance of DNA damage. And therefore, therefore, if you see um, the, 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 in the, the DNA damage is occurring, mutations occurring in this area of tumor versus these are distinctly different. And here the, you know, in real time in gastro, in, in endoscope, uh, uh, sorry, chronoscope, you find tumors. This is a tumor and this is a, colon area, and sometimes tumor sits flat on the surface of the colonic epithelium. Sometimes it protrudes into the lumen. If it protrudes into the lumen, then it obstructs the passage. That's what you feel constipation. And the colon cancer symptom is the feces comes very thin stream. It's not like a solid, so it is very thin. If you start seeing the very thin stream of feces, more likely that is one of the indication, early indications of colon cancer. Now, pathologically, it goes through all these steps. You know, this is nice. I'm talking about this normal area, not the tumor area. This is the colonic uh, area. Nice histology, meaning nice means cells are small, and uh, these are crypts, and these are the absorptive surfaces of the colonic, uh, colonic region. A lot of absorption of water and nutrients will occur in these crypts. And when the cancer develops, look at it, this part, when you see the histology, the cells are nicely organized here. Here they are crowded, means the proliferation is started growing. And these are called adenomas are the polyps. And these polyps slowly grow and become bigger. And these are polyps and advanced stage polyps, but they are still sitting on the surface of the epithelium. And uh, they are called carcinoma in situ in pathologic term. And slowly these tumor cells, these cells, slowly invading into the lower layers. This is a fat, a circular muscular layer, and muscularis mucosa, submucosa, and into these underlying layers. And slowly the tumor cells infiltrate, uh, migrate into the deeper levels. Now yeah, the cancer, look at it. The architecture, such a nice tubular architecture has become gland glandular, irregular shape, and these are cancers. And these are, still localized to the organ that is colon. But once they grow faster, then this, these cells will get into the circulatory system and eventually go to different organs of the body. And most favorite secondary site of colon cancer is the liver. So that's what, when you have a metastatic stage four disease, meaning cancer already left the colonic colon and reached to the liver. And that's what you see these nodules in the liver. And by the time the patient um, gets these uh, cancer spreading from colon to the liver, there is no way, uh, you know, the survival is very less, hardly two to uh, three years. Now, during this process, I said this is histology or morphology. This is what pathology under the microscope you see, but you cannot see what are the molecular changes occurring. And the molecular changes can be at meta metabolism, Metabolites uh, are those enzymes, are the proteins, RNA, and it can be DNA because mutations are occurring in DNA. For example, if you take DNA, again, there are different types of genetic alterations, point mutations, genomic instability, interchromosomal rearrangements, intrachromosomal rearrangements, and epigenetic alterations means some genes, as you grow older, they start uh, expressing low levels because of the methylations, that's what aging process, methylation and the aging process is directly related because you know, uh, when I was young, I used to eat this, I don't have any problem. Now I'm mid fifties and sixties and seventies. I have a lot of gas formation, IBS. That is the best example for 
the epigenetic meaning the enzymes which were digesting your gluten gluten that is coming from wheat that enzyme is not being synthesized then you started developing fermenting and forming this gas so that's what the epigenetics plays a vital role in the aging and that process is also highly implicated in the progression of the cancer so which genetic alteration you go after that is a challenge so in relation to cancer colon cancer because that's my research interest colon cancers can develop in multiple pathways meaning look at it all of them are colon cancers but if they go through this pathway for example first BRAF mutation, then the methylation, then the microsatellite instability. If a tumor colon cancer develops by following these molecular pathways, that is less rapid, means indolent, slow growing. If I'm lucky, if I get a cancer, if I get a colon cancer, if that cancer follows this molecular pathway, that is going to be very slow growing, so the survival will be longer. But again, another type of colon cancer there, if they follow APC mutation first between normal and this polyp, then eventually P53 mutations, that type of tumors are growing faster, faster than the first one, and they are moderate rapidly. Moderately rapid means they go not that slow, not that fast. However, if you see this, this pathway, this is also colon cancer, APC mutations, ARAS mutations, P53 mutations, if a tumor follows this pathway, it is very aggressive. Majority of most of the times, the drugs may not work on this colon cancer. That's why I say, you know what, this gentleman diagnosed with this colon cancer, you know, he survived for 20 years. But you know, X, Y, Z person diagnosed uh, same cancer colon, but passed away within two to three years because we do not know what are the underlying genetic alterations which follow, followed by those um, uh, colon cancers. Now, using this, what we thought when I was a fellow, when I joined here uh, uh, at UAB, this P53 was just discovered and it was a molecule of the year in 1994. So my mentor suggested, hey, Upender, why don't you work on uh, this molecule because everyone is talking about this recently identified, discovered and um, characterized. Why don't you work on colon cancer and particular mutation? A particular molecule, absolutely have no idea. I joined here at UAB in 94, December, uh, uh, big, uh, late December, uh, before uh, mid December, and I have no idea what is this molecule is all about, how the colon cancer is. Then I started looking into the literature, and this molecule has different functions. It is involved in several biological pathways cell cycle, apoptosis, autophagy, cell differentiation, all these mechanisms in, in a cell. So which pathway I need to study? I have no idea. And also the study is coming up that these mutations, if there is a mutation in the P53, these mutations are gain of functions, meaning if wild type protein without a mutation, that protein function is go back and repair the DNA damage. And that is a wild type protein P53 function. If that protein itself is, uh, the gene itself is mutated and producing mutant P53, what it does, it is a tumor suppressor, but it lost that function. Tumor means that repairing, it's not going to go and repair the DNA damage. Or, and it also gains some additional oncogenic properties, meaning it lost the suppressiveness, the functional suppress, tumor, suppression, tumor suppression, but it gained some additional features so that, you know, what is happening if there's a mutation, the reports are there that is, is resistant to the chemotherapy in colon cancer. So it's a very complex molecule, where to start? Then this is a lesson for these uh, masters and PhD students. Literature search is utmost important feature in science. You have to dig through in those days, go to the library, in a current sciences, now everything in front of the computer, you can search these PubMeds or Google Scholar or whatever, do thorough research or literature search. And at that time, in my literature search, what I found, the studies published from Europe on this P53 in colon cancer consistently said that P53 mutations are bad prognostic indicators of colon cancer. 
But the studies coming from United States have mixed findings. Some studies reported that this molecule uh, mutations are good progn bad prognostic indicators. And some studies published from Southern part of uh, United States, they said there is no value for this mutation. That added the confusion. Then I started looking at why, why this, then I went into the population constituents, like what is the composition of populations they studied. And what we found that the studies published from South consistently said that there's no value for this. Is it because of this racial admixture? Because in Southern states, about 25 to 30% of the patient pool is African-American. Remaining 60 to 65% or Caucasian are European descent. Is it really that population admixture is skewing these results, saying that this is not, uh, this molecule is not important? And for that, what I did, I collected 200 colon cancer tissues from our hospital and the 300 um, Caucasians. And when I did this mutation analysis, it's a long story, is a two years work I'm showing in this figure. So when we correlated with the survival means, we know this is a retrospective study. We went back and assessed, sequenced, identified the mutation. And this group, this dotted group, the wild type means there are no mutations, even though they are colon cancer patients. And here the solid line group of patients are with mutated. Uh, they have a, a P53 mutation. When, when we did the statistical analysis, we did not find much difference between these two uh, groups of patients with mutations, without mutations. If a patient is African-American, when the tumors are located in the proximal colon, means that tube I showed you, um, the different anatomic locations of the uh, gut, uh, the large bowel, and in African-Americans, this molecule is not important whether the tumors are located in the proximal colon or the distal colorectum. However, if you see the Caucasians means white patients, if a patient is white, if the tumors are located in the proximal colon, if those tumors are mutated for the P53, all of them died within 10 years after surgery. So this is 10 years, 120 months after surgery. So all of them died in 10 years. And the wild type P53 mutation bearing patients are still surviving even after 15 years. So that type of um, identifying the subsets of patients. Now, the same mutation is not important. If a patient is white, if the tumors are located in the distal colon or the rectal region. Uh, so that type of precision. Now, what happened? This type of teasing out type of subset analysis was not done. Therefore, if you club these two patients and write it, what happens? The curve will show like that, meaning there's no difference. So that's why you need to tease out and go back and do this type of um, detailed analysis in order to conclude whether a particular alteration is good or bad. Now, in biomarker discovery and validation, major important factor is validation. Now, this is one finding. I got all these patients from my hospital in Birmingham. But is it true? Is it a, is a, is a statistical blip? Is it accidentally found? Because that sometimes happens, like a bias can occur. I might have selected unknowingly very select patients very uh, a subset of patients are knowing. So that type of bias can incorporate and that bias might have given a very good result. So therefore, what you need to do, you need to validate these findings. For that, we went to a different hospital, one from, Bas one from Baltimore, another from Atlanta, and we got these patients. And in African, precisely we reproduced in African-Americans, this molecule, mutation, this mutation P53 is not important in predicting the outcomes, whereas in White patients, European descent patients, if the tumors are proximal, uh, located in the proximal tumor, and uh, these mutation bearing patients are dying early, look at the p value, meaning 99.971 times that is true. And another thing I want to tell the students that statistics is very important. I know when we were in masters, my friends and uh, we used to make joke uh, that, uh, you know, biometry, biostatistics, why we need to study mathematics. Let me tell you, it is at most important in any branch of science. 
mathematics, statistics, uh, very, very important. So you cannot get away uh, from uh, these areas. So we reproduced. So it means this confidence gone up. Now, how to bring this? Are we using this P53 mutation sequencing diagnostic pathology? Not yet, because it's a lengthy process in order to get those approvals and get, it, get these tests done in, I will show you on one slide down uh, uh, next. Now, this is one molecule, one mutation, and uh, that's what we observed. Now, what we did, the next question is why these proximal tumor mutations? What type of mutations they are? Now, again, we are drilling down, then went to the next stage, and we sequenced, uh, we analyzed the sequence data. What we found, missense point mutations, you know what are, what are missense point mutations? If a mutation leading to the change in the amino acid, that type of mutations are more commonly found in white patients, and that type of mutations are very rare in African-American patients. Look at it. Now we are seeing, oh, this type of mutation versus that type of mutation. However, what we found, a polymorphism is very high in African-American patients. And that type of polymorphisms we did not find in uh, Caucasians. Then we went after what this polymorphism, this polymorphism is at codon 72 of the P53, same gene, but this is not a uh, missense point mutation. Missense point mutation, I told you, uh, amino acid change, but the polymorphism is, the change is occurring in the third place of the codon, you know, three triplet codons, first position, second position, if in a, nucleotide change occurs in first and second, then that leads to the amino acid bringing a different class of amino acid versus the in triplet codon, if the nucleotide change, that will bring the same class of amino acid because they are having structurally similar. So the protein folding and the three dimensional structure of the protein will be same. So it will perform the same function. That is the polymorphism. And that, those polymorphisms are more commonly found in African-Americans. Then that was really curious. I gave this project to a student and I asked, hey, why don't you collect the literature published from all parts of the world? Look at this polymorphism because the single nucleotide polymorphisms are at risk for developing some sort of cancer, need not be colon or breast. So in those individuals, what that gentleman did, um, started looking into the literature. The first reported paper published in 1960 by South African scientists saying that that polymorphism, meaning that you, know, you have two alleles, one for the ma mother, one from uh, father, these two alleles, and one allele is a, uh, that nucleotide gives to the proline, another one is also proline, that is homozygous proline, proline phenotype. That type of proline, proline phenotype in P53 at codon 72 was first reported in chimpanzees in Central Africa. Now, there are some studies published from other parts of Africa. Look at it, these red dots, proline, proline, now have become green and yellow. Meaning, this proline, proline, if one allele is mutated, this is proline, the other one is arginine. In place of proline, it is bringing arginine. So arginine, proline, that is heterozygous, and if both alleles are mutated or changed, then you have arginine, arginine. So this green and yellow are started appearing. And this is, you know, Africa, Northern Africa, and Egypt, through Egypt, got, in, uh, got into the Europe. Here we go. When you see, when we map these studies at this polymorphism, this genotype, this phenotype completely changed. More reds here and less reds in the European part. Most of them are green and yellows. And in India, still we see some sort of uh, reds in Singapore area, this part of Southeast Asia and here, because you know, I think uh, a CCMB, um, uh, Dr. Thangarajan group, they clearly demonstrated that uh, the DNA, using DNA poly, um, um, uh, genetic profiles, they showed that the South Indians are more closer to the Africans 
compared to these Northern Indians. So this similarly, this allele is also migrating or following the same trend. Because here we go, we are looking at the cancer, but it may not be specific to the cancer. It may be related to other diseases. That's what genetics and this, you know, hardy Weinberg glass, all those things, what we studied in college, that's what we applied here. What is the frequency of alleles of this particular gene in different parts of the world? And this is what we found that if you have a proline proline phenotype, because majority of the African Americans here, they have this proline proline phenotype, therefore they may be at, at, at increased risk of developing uh, some sort of cancers. How I'm doing for the time wise, I started, whoa, man, I'm going uh, one and a half hours. So I will quickly run through. Dr. Rao, Dr. Uh, um, yes, so I'll quickly run through. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, fine, so sir. it's going on fine, sir. Yeah. So I'll skip some of them and I'll go back to some. So here are the conclusions, the P53. Based on this, what we concluded that in African-Americans, P53 mutations are bad prognostic indicators for, Afri um, for whites, for blacks, this mutation. And admixture, what I hypothesized when I joined as a fellow that is it admixture of the patient population skewing the results? Indeed, African-Americans and Caucasians have distinct profiles. And uh, now, you know, cancer is not developing because of one mutation, one alteration. It is because of multiple genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic alterations. How to take all of them together? It is difficult, but still efforts are on in, in the world. So we spent a lot of time and you know, had an international collaboration with 11 countries. We got the samples and we did some sort of gene sequencing. And uh, these are uh, uh, you know, sequence data using uh, for identifying the good and bad prognostic uh, patients, particularly stage two colon cancer. What happened in, the, in colon cancer, stage two is very important. When you are diagnosed routinely, they undergo surgery, they do not receive any chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is given only for stage three and stage four patients. But these stage twos, pathologically they are stage two, but after some time they progress faster and behave like stage three and stage four. Can we identify these aggressive stage twos in colon cancer, that was a question. And we went after, used this sequence data and validated thoroughly and identified. And using this company in Ireland, they patented it uh, because we were one of the uh, major uh, contributors. And uh, um, however, they had a patent and they developed this genomic health uh, diagnostic kit. Now, I want to tell these uh, students that application of um, computational biology is an emerging field and some efforts we did in our, uh, in our laboratory. I want to show that and, and wrap up after this, uh, this particular uh, section. And here, uh, you know, there are a lot of algorithms used for biomarker discoveries. This is really fascinating to me. There is an algorithm called lasso Coulter iter which is an algorithm, a computational um, a tool developed and which is more commonly used in spatial navigation, uh, uh, navigation, meaning in the aeroplanes and in the spacecrafts, this algorithm is used. What it does, it collects the real-time data and uh, using that real-time data, the trajectory of the plane is determined or the satellite is determined. So that is the algorithm. When someone gave this talk in our cancer center, after the talk, I was talking to that expert and, hey, you know what? The cancers are also not static. They are dynamic. They are changing from low, st like a normal, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Maybe there are some sub-stages in between. We do not know at this point. Can we apply this algorithm on the sequence data, RNA sequencing data we generated on about 100 colon cancer patients? And, um, and we applied that. Very interesting findings we, uh, we observed. You know, this A, this is normal colonic epithelial cells separated, did the sequencing on RNA. And what we found, look at it. And uh, it's very difficult to go back and see which knobby, which node is what. So this blue are the activated 
hubs of a pathway. And for example, this is a X molecule. It, it has connections to other molecules like, you know, red is activating, means this molecule is activating other molecule, or if it is connected with a red line to other molecule means it is receiving a repressive effect from other molecule. So that type of nodes or hubs we identified, and there are a lot of, you know, crosstalk, of course, molecules are interlinked or interconnected, and we found this type of connections or interactions among various molecules in normal cell. When this becomes stage two or stage one, early, early stages, look at it, entirely new different set of blue hubs are formed. Like for example, this one, this new hub is activated in early, leisure, early cancer of colon, but that hub is completely absent in a normal cell. Now, when a tumor moves from stage two to stage three, look at it, number of hubs gone down. Look at this prominent one, this is completely missing. Meaning if you develop a drug to target this particular hub molecule, you give this drug to this patient, but this patient by the time this tumor progresses to the stage three, the drug is not going to work because that molecular activation or that hub is completely absent or missed in stage three. Now look at from stage three to stage four means when the tumor moves from the region to the liver or to the distant organ, entirely different set of new molecular hubs are activated. And therefore, it's very difficult to develop one drug, give an injection, you're hoping that patient is going to be cured, that's not going to happen because of this dynamic nature of the molecular pathways. And I'll give one example by highlighting one molecule. I think this is hub here, this is MAD4, and look at it, SMAD4 is one molecule in normal cell. Look at the connections. Number of connections are very few and its interactions are few. By the time, same molecule, how it is behaving in cancer cell, entirely different. Number of connections gone up, increased number. So therefore, it's very difficult. Even if you block it, the alternative pathways will kick in. So therefore, there are a lot of challenges in the cancer research and that is the reason it is, uh, is a very difficult disease to develop a drug, or even if you develop, you can prolong the survival. And what we know today is this much, only the tip of the iceberg. We know what we know uh, about the cancer is only this much. This needs to be discovered. That's what we need, this young generation or a large pool of scientists we need in order to address just one disease. Look at it, similarly, cardiovascular, diabetes, other diseases, that's what we need more and more scientists so that we may understand, slowly understanding the majority of the, uh, the cancer issues. But it needs a nice coordination among all these experts. It's not only the basic scientists like me, that you need to work with the clinicians, it's not easy. Clinicians are extremely busy and it's very difficult to identify those academic interest people, people with academic interest. Then you need to work with them. You develop this uh, rapport and you know, bring the health professionals. You may be thinking in a different direction, sitting in the laboratory, but in the community, the doctors, the health workers, they have their own issues. You need to learn from them, start incorporating into your scheme of things. Informatics, uh, as I gave example, now artificial intelligence, all these new technology you can incorporate into your biological science in order to accomplish this. And you need bioethicists and advocates. You know, you keep talking about giving all these lectures all over the world until and unless politicians, advocates means not these lawyers, you know, advocates means the cancer advocates going to the government, going to the agencies. Hey, sir, we need to put a lot of money into this area because this is becoming a, a health, major health problem in the, in the country, in the world. And also you need bioethicists because you are dealing with humans. You have to be highly cognizant about all these nitty gritty details. You know, injecting whatever the trial you think is the best molecule, you start doing clinical trials without following those ethicals, ethical issues, you will be in big trouble. So therefore ethics, not only conducting the clinical trial, you need ethics in the laboratory also. For the students and postdoctoral fellows and graduate students, I always tell, do not manipulate the data. 
you may get a paper, you may get a degree, or if you are in a junior faculty, you know, get to promotion, you need five papers, 10 papers to associate professor, then 10 papers, don't follow that. You may get a promotion, but if no one is going to reproduce your work, it is useless. You know, you are causing, adding noise to the literature rather than doing good to the humanity. Remember ethics, 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 responsible way of conducting research is at most important in my opinion. Of course, funding and the regulatory agencies, you know, there are a lot of restrictions. It's not fun. Being a research, basic researcher doing this type of work, how much hardship you need to go through the, all these regulatory, IRBs, IACOGs, regular HIPAA regulations, it's a hell of a lot of a job. You know, it's not easy. Therefore, some people, what they do, hey, you know what? I don't want to do this translational research. Simply take cell lines, cut the gene, insert it, put it. That is very important to understand the biology of the molecule. But in order to bring these discoveries to the clinic, you have to follow these guidelines. So now one example I'll give you, this is the best example. Philadelphia chromosome, meaning the translocation of between ninth chromosome and 22nd chromosome, a BCR able um, translocation, first discovered in 1960 in um, chronic myelo uh, myelogenous uh, leukemias. But by the time the, dr the, developed, the drug is developed and approved by FDA, it took nearly close 40 years. It's, not, it's a very tough journey from 1960 to 2001, that is 40 years it took. But now that has been reduced tremendously by applying a lot of technology. This advancing technology really helped in cutting short this. And the best example is this COVID vaccine. Look at it, record 11 months time. By the time the disease identified, characterized this RNA genome and uh, you know developing all these um, going through all these experiments, eventually now they are talking about releasing the vaccine um, uh, in, uh, in a month or so. So that is the best example. That's the best scenario and this is the worst scenario. Meaning most of them will fall into this because of this is emergency. That's what the government, these regulatory agencies are very, uh, what you call uh, approving using those acts, but that's not going to happen for this type of diseases. So therefore, it may not take that fast, but it will be another four to five years by the time you identify something in the laboratory and becomes to the uh, becoming to the clinic. Why? Here, every molecule has to go through this all these phases before it reaches to the clinic. And I'm not going to go into the details, but every phase, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, four, you need to recruit the patient. You need to do the same old story because some people say, oh, what is a novelty? You know, same P53 gene is talking about, uh, yes, because you need to prove that is true in phase one, phase two, phase three, and eventually you develop uh, a drug and take the FDA approval and to bring into the clinic. Now, that bringing the clinic is not going to say that is going to solve the problem. There are several examples. After introducing into the clinic, meaning started giving the drug to the patients, they are not working. Why? In the laboratory conditions, in the clinical trial conditions, for example, this um, drug Arbutex, which is approved by FDA, hoping that it is going to give 18 to 20% efficacy in colon cancer. But when they started giving this real-time, real-world, um, uh, therapy uh, uh, given to the patients, that efficacy rate gone from 18% to 6%. Then they were all pulling what went wrong and they went back, you see, from bench, it came to, it went to bed, but it did not work as anticipated. They brought back to the uh, bench and they said that even though this drug is developed against the EGFR mutations, but later they found that not the EGFR mutation alone, you need to look for the KRAS mutation also in order to see the efficacy, show the efficacy of the Arbutex. Therefore, now what they are doing, they are doing mutation analysis for the EGFR, and they are also need to do for the mutation analysis of the KRAS. Therefore, just a drug is released into the market or given to the patient doesn't mean there's no guarantee that the drug is going to work. So again, you need to do research. How many patients are given, how this efficacy is. And uh, 
Now, this is about biology, biology, drug development. But in a bigger scheme of things, a patient outcome is influenced by all these features. What I discussed is only this right part, diagnosis, prognosis, treatment. I did not talk about the, sal the therapies, what type of surgeries are done, how skilled the surgeon is, what are the social behavioral aspects, means cancer survivors, they have to do exercise, means has an impact. Exercise has a positive impact on the efficacy of the therapy, as well as the survival, and even the protection. So these you know, counseling, you know, outreach, community outreach, and genetic testing, there are a lot of other factors you need to integrate with in order to have an effective uh, cancer treatment strategies. Eventually, this is the last slide. So in order to bring personalized therapy, personalized therapy means based on the molecular profiles of a tumor, you design the drug regimen and you need to identify because of those reasons, re reasons I mentioned, X, X molecule is very active, but you keep identifying those novel targets. What are the targetable molecules? Not every molecule is targetable. If you block a very important molecule for the survival of the um, cell or humans, you cannot do, you don't want, even though it is activated in cancers, you cannot target that type of. So you need to identify the targetable molecules. And the other lesson we learned is cancer in different parts of the world is different, even though they are colon cancer. As I said, it developed in India versus United States, completely different. And eventually all these strategies, incorporating the public health policies, government policies, then you know if you can come up with a strategy to reduce uh, the cancer burden that will help the human beings and the socioeconomic burden of the a burden due to the cancer. And this is not me alone, it's a teamwork. Several people contributed to this work and a lot of fellow, current fellows, past fellows, junior faculty and the collaborations, they are pathologists, surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, statisticians, bioinformaticists, all these and different institutions contributed to the study and today, in my talk, I know this talk I would like to dedicate because I know there are four or five, my uh, two or three, my teachers and my professors, my friends are attending this talk. I know because they texted me, one uh, from New Zealand, uh, Dr. Um, um, Rajendra Madhav and uh, Sharad Babu, they're all my cl classmates because I forwarded this, hey, you know, this is your Indian timing. So if you find time, you can attend. So I really thank and I dedicate this to my teachers, lecturers, professors, classmates, family and friends. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over almost um, two hours. One and a half hours. Almost two hours, sir. Almost two hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry this is. No problem, you know, sir. It is a wonderful yeah. lecture, sir. It is a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Wonderful. Yes. If you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be glad to uh, answer if any questions. I think there are some um, comments. Uh, are, are you? There are a few questions from the participants. So, sir, do you have time to take up this question? Absolutely. I have another 10, 15 minutes. I have another meeting. Okay, sir. Please, sir. Please ask questions, okay. uh, Jatan Shema. Okay, sir, like uh, one of the participants is asking if there's one pathogenic mutation in an oncogene in patient, cancer patient, as, as well as in healthy control, is it possible that the population is already predisposed or the little mutation become um, effectless for this population? Right. If it is a germline mutation, if it is oncogenic, if it is present both in normal and tumor, that patient, that individual may be at risk for developing cancer. Particularly, another thing we also know, every malignant cell won't become cancer. If you remember, I said only 5% of the polyps may become if they are cancerous, meaning majority of the times, these pre-malignant lesions resolve back. Meaning, even though this is the beauty of the body, 
it can repair. There's an auto repair mechanism. But particularly the answer to that question is yes, if it is a germline mutation, more likely that patient is, that individual is at risk for developing. But the finding a mutation in a normal individual there is no guarantee that one single mutated, even though that is a missense point mutation, normally found in tumor case, if that mutation stays not repaired, or if that, cells, that cell survives and proliferates and becomes tumor, look at it how many, if, if, if that patient may develop into cancer, but that individual can be under surveillance. Okay, sir. So one more question, uh, like two more questions we have, like uh, from your lecture, like uh, you have clearly mentioned that there could be some racial, because of the difference in the racial and ethnic, group, ethnic groups, like the, the same kind of, uh, like we can see different variants in the same gene, say for example, like P53. So if, uh, if anybody wants to have uh, studies on the uh, variants in the same gene, or uh, at the genomic level, what would be the best? What will be the best? So if I understand, I can, I can understand and I'll give you answers in multiple ways. One way is this type of racial ethnic differences, this type of studies, you can do it in India also. Majority of them, I think we are belong to the same, but there are some different ethnic groups. As I said, single nucleotide polymorphisms are race ethnic specific, meaning particular type of single nucleotide polymorphisms are clustered in that particular ancestry or particular genetic ancestry people. So you need to identify like BRCA1, BRCA2, how they were identified. They were identified in Ashkenazi Jews and they are hardly, only 6% of Ashkenazi Jews have these BRCA1, BRCA2 back to mutations. But look at it, are we Jews? We do not know because remember, uh, this is one thing I want to convey to the researchers that every human being, like even if you take white European and go back and do the gene pool analysis, about five to 6% of that person's gene pool is African ancestry because that reflects the evolution. So similarly, if you have that type of genetic alterations are the single nucleotide polymorphisms, are they, it can be pre-53 gene, it can, those uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in any other gene that can be identified in whole genome sequencing uh, um, efforts. You can identify, see through functional, because it's impossible. There are, there's a, you know, 95, 98% of the DNA is a junk DNA. That's what we call but nothing is junk now. Every part of the genome is important. If this single nuclear high risk allele or single nucleotide polymorphism is sitting in some non transcript or in the exonic, in intronic region, go back, identify, and you can screen that in that population. So, therefore, even though it's a fishing expedition, every region, for example, in your region, Mizoram, you may know certain tribes or some certain ethnic groups, isolate DNA, do these exploratory studies. Those become the libraries for future studies. They are, you know, people discard when they write the grants that, oh, this is fishing expedition in United States or this type of study is done. No, that type of studies are not done to the region. That's what Indian context. Now, race and ethnicity, one aspect, and also dietary habits. You know, some people, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, huge difference, huge difference. So, um, uh, uh, you know, people living in the rural urban area, lot of differences. So that's what every study, this molecular mapping should be done in every part. That's what I concluded in my um, uh, concluding slide. So yes, that type of studies can be done and that can be located in any gene, any part of the genome. Okay, sir. Uh, that one of the participants has cited one of the earlier published paper with Renewal et al. 2008. In that study, based on the two hit uh, model, so they have studied the Caucasian population and the African population with respect to P53 variants. 
So if that would be the case, what would be the best approach in finding one of the hits of the two? If we want to study in a meso population. Right. This two hit theory proposed by the Nudson hypothesis, right? If I understand correctly, the question is talking about the two hit story, Nudson hypothesis, meaning first cancer, the cell, one mutation occurs. That mutation may not be enough to transform the cell from the normal to the tumor. That cell, which is already having one hit means one mutation, there's another hit occurs. That second hit compounds the alterations or the leads to the abnormal pathologic, pathologic pathways, and then it becomes cancerous. Of course, now we know cancer cell is because of one hit or two hits. Still that hypothesis holds good, but now you know multiple alterations are occurring in a cancer cell. So tracing out what is a first hit, what is a second hit retrospectively, like for example, you take a stage three, stage four tumor, you do the genetic analysis, and from the genetic analysis, it's very difficult to tell what is the first hit, what is the second hit. But that is possible if you are dealing with the early malignant lesions like polyps. There, you can see what, how many mutations are occurring. Again, it is a huge story, but yes, um, this two hit theory still holds good, but now multiple alterations can occur simultaneously that will contribute to the progression of the disease or the, the development of the disease or the progression of the disease. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, I, I have one question. Uh -huh. uh, uh, sir, given the complexity of this uh, disease progression and the mechanics, what role synthetic biology can play in solving this uh, issue? Right. So, you know, synthetic biology means screening uh, drugs, identifying uh, the vulnerability, right? Uh, vulnerabilities. Again, even though it's a complex, this is the biggest question. Where to start? That is a, that is a question everyone asks. When the issue is so complex, where to start? You know, this chemo prevention people start working on the chemo, how to prevent. Like <clears throat> you are screening, drug screening. A lot of efforts, particularly if I were you, I do not want to work in an ac academic setting, that type of issue. Why? It is expensive, laborious, high throughput. Mainly the pharmaceutical industry or pharmaceutical companies are best place for that type of efforts. But if you have an expert in that, if you want to start in an academic setting to train the students, that is a different story. But um, yes, there are a lot of efforts going into this, identifying the vulnerabilities by using this uh, uh, drug screening, um, um, but it has it 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 has its own issues and uh, problems. But experts can deal with it. Um, but I suggest that is not an ideal uh, academic setting. Is not an ideal for that type of studies. That's in my opinion. Thank you, sir. Yes. Right. Uh, so, uh, so thank you very much. It was a very wonderful talk. All the participants have commented in the chat box that uh, they really enjoyed the talk and uh, the talk was very informative. So uh, really you had started from basic epidemiology into population and then going into a molecular uh, I mean, level and then finally translating it into uh, you know, for early diagnosis as well as for prognosis. So, so it was really a very eye opening talk and uh, interesting, sir. Uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. sir, in National University of Singapore, there was one study which said that uh, the elephants don't get cancer because they have multiple copies of TP53 gene. Uh, so uh, uh, what is your say on that? Sir? I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm not aware of it, but once you said multiple P53 molecules, meaning more efficient tumor suppression, that's all I can predict at this point because P53 is a tumor suppressor. You know, if you have two copies versus multiple copies, it's a more efficient way of tumor suppression. Probably that could be the reason why elephants are not getting, but I'm not aware uh, the why and how the yeah. elephants do not get cancer. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So but the, that is my educated guess. Yeah. Uh, yes. Based on the role of the P53. Yeah. Right, sir. Right, sir. So, uh, so sir, your uh, talk was very, very interesting, especially in Mizoram context, like uh, the exact process what we are into now. We have started with epidemiology and then we have. Uh, we are now looking at the mutations at the population level. And uh, we are also sequencing the healthy controls now to uh, generate a kind of a database uh, variants. And uh, so we are now to analyze. So we'll be in touch with you and uh, we would uh, request your uh, support and uh, collaboration so that we could further uh, grow, uh, especially the kind of activities that you have been involved through in, uh, in, in Britain, man. Uh, same thing we would uh, like to actually initiate at a low level here. So, like right. for example, uh, Center for uh, Disparity uh, this, uh, uh, this Research and uh, including the various components of it. So, so it was right. Very so, the, I strongly suggest, uh, you know, even though some of them are repetitive, you know, it may not look novel from outset, yes. but I don't mind. I will repeat these studies, you know, Western right. studies. <clears throat> how they are useful to, you know, I'll give you one example. The drugs developed in US are in Europe, clinical trials done, all the stuff. And those are, tell me how many Indians are participating in those global clinical trials. Right. They're tested in Europeans or in Africans or some parts yes. of the world. The same drug, once approved, oh yeah, is developed in United States, approved in India, and you yes. keep Bring the same drug to Indian population, what is a guarantee that it's going to work? Right. Or, yes. in my opinion, that's what I was keep advocating in my last concluding slide. Yes. Your mapping of the studies, even though is a repetition, I don't care. It should be done in Mizoram. It should be done in Hyderabad. I mean, in Telangana, yeah. Andhra, Tamil Nadu, whatever. Because if you see the map of India, every yes. region has a distinct uh, incidence of cancers. Yes. Hyderabad hometown, uh, ga uh, gastrointestinal, uh, the uh, gastric cancers and colon cancers are very high. Yes. And, and in cervical cancers, Pune. And your area, you said uh, gastric cancers, Tamil Nadu, and uh, uh, breast cancer, very high in Punjab and uh, yes. foothills of Himalayas. You right. know, right. that's what I'm telling. Give, do not worry about what others are. If it is really relevant to your backyard, do that, even if it is a repetition, because you need to develop these modalities for your own population. Then only you can develop this preci real precision medicine, in my opinion, should come from that local region. What is adapted from Western world? What is adapted in, within India? How complex India is? Yes. That's what I strongly suggest. Keep doing that type of local studies. They are awfully important in my opinion. And I'm glad to share whatever the little experience I gained over a, year, over a period of several years. And I'm glad Thank to you. meet you guys. And, uh, uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it will be a great uh, I mean, beginning for us sir, with you, uh, with your support. Yeah. Uh, so Excellent. I, yes, sir. So, uh, I think our Vice Chancellor, Professor. Okay, so, uh, maybe actually our Vice Chancellor was in another interview in the University Okay, of that's fine. So I know. I took going longer time. Than, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Longer yes. than I went over uh, 15, 20 minutes, 6 minutes. Actually, he was online only. Yeah, yes. Sir. Okay. Okay, sir. So, that's uh, great. Uh, thank you very much once again for the wonderful and very informative talk. Uh, and uh, we are very glad that we could, uh, uh, I mean, uh, hear your talk today. So, and, uh, yeah, it's my pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.